get this started. Welcome everyone. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the first edition of our monthly Institute for Policy Studies lunch table talks. I'm Tope Falarin and I'm the executive director at the Institute for Policy Studies. IPS is a research organization that works with social movements to turn progressive policy ideas into action. This series will be a casual space for our expert researchers to share what they've been analyzing lately. For a climate policy project director, Basav Sen, that's been the climate policy choices of the Biden administration and specifically Biden's actions at the recent climate change conference in Glasgow, Scotland, or COP26. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Please write any questions you have in the Q&A box throughout the talk or by commenting if you're watching this on Facebook and Basap will answer as many questions as he can after he's finished with his presentation. And now I'd like to present Basap Sen. Thanks so much for that intro, Tope. And um, before I launch in, um, just very briefly, um, I'm going to be talking about the climate negotiations that happened in Scotland in a way that may not be what you've seen presented in much of media coverage. Um, it's a behind the scenes analysis uh, that that you know puts the entire thing in context of what's happening internationally and what's happening at home. Uh, so with that, if we can jump to the first slide. So it's very important to preface any discussion of COP26 as the UN um, climate talks uh, were, were named uh, by saying that the underlying process for organizing uh, the climate talks was fundamentally unjust. And let's see why. We can jump to the next slide. So what does climate action have to do with COVID? Well, everything. Here we see the uh, density of COVID vaccine doses administered per 100 people in different parts of the world. And you see some stark disparities between wealthier countries and poorer countries. Um, and especially, I'd like you to note uh, how low the rates of vaccination are in Africa. Uh, the white, by the way, means that there isn't enough data. So it's, uh, so uh, we don't even know necessarily the rates of vaccination in the countries that are um, uh, shown as white. Um, and the light yellow is the lowest uh, rate of vaccination. Uh, so, um, as you can see, a lot of Africa is, uh, you know, very low rates of vaccination. Um, another thing which, you know, to the extent that you can see it on the map uh, is uh, um, uh, the low rates of vaccination in Central America, the little portion that's in between uh, Mexico and then um, down in Costa Rica and Panama, where they look like they have higher rates. Uh, and another little blip uh, I'd like to uh, point out is Bangladesh, which is, uh, uh, again, not very visible because it's such a small country, but it's a little portion just at the eastern end of India that, that you can see has a very low rate of vaccination. And from the next slide, you'll understand why I'm talking about those three countries in particular or those three regions in particular. So here, what we are seeing is per capita greenhouse gas emissions by country relative to the United States. So the US is 100 uh, in this. And we see that some oil rich countries in the Middle East like 
Qatar and Saudi Arabia are higher than the US in terms of uh, per capita greenhouse gas emissions. Um, other wealthy countries like, like Germany is a little more than half the level of the US. Uh, China and India, which get blamed a lot for driving the climate crisis, have per capita emissions, in the case of China, less than half. Uh, and in the case of India, barely more than one-tenth of the US. And now let's look at some countries in um, uh, Central America and Africa and the Caribbean. Uh, those levels, as you saw, were um, less than a tenth, uh, you know, of, of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions levels of the U.S. Next slide, please. So what we're seeing here is what I term an asymmetry of causation and impact, meaning that those countries who contribute least to the problems of climate change face some of the worst impacts. Uh, for example, um, Somalia uh, has been ravaged by a prolonged multi-year drought. Um, Honduras faces, uh, you know, both the droughts and the hurricanes. Uh, Haiti has been repeatedly hit by hurricanes, and Bangladesh is severely impacted by floods and by sea level rise. It's a very low-lying country, um, and it's important to point out is it's not just that these countries are facing severe climate change impacts. Uh, they are also less able to deal with the problem because they are low income countries to begin with. And one other thing I'd like to point out with all four of these countries is the issue of migration. So we have seen um, immigrants from Haiti and from Honduras uh, brutalized on the US-Mexico border uh, repeatedly over years. Uh, and people from Somalia and elsewhere in Northeast Africa trying to cross the Mediterranean in leaky boats. Uh, and people from Bangladesh who try to make it to India next door and the government of India responds uh, by uh, building an electric fence on the border with Bangladesh. So repeatedly what we're seeing is that the countries who are facing devastating impacts of climate change, uh, you know, people are trying to escape from them and the rest of the world and especially wealthy countries are not very welcoming of people trying to escape for the sake of their survival. Next slide, please. So, what the COVID vaccination data and the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions data together, you know, the story that they tell is that the countries who are most impacted by climate change are least able to participate in the climate talks. Uh, and, you know, remember that UN climate talks are always exclusionary for delegates from poorer countries because of the travel and hotel costs involved. Uh, but the pandemic made things exponentially worse. Uh, so people traveling to the UK are required to be vaccinated. And while that may on one level make sense, on another level, it's also exclusionary in the context of what I'm terming global vaccine apartheid. Uh, many of the poorest countries in the world who are also most impacted by climate change were on a red list. Uh, that required them to quarantine for 10 days after arriving in the UK, which greatly adds to um, the costs of hotel stay. Uh, and those quarantine restrictions were lifted, but at the last minute, right before the talks. Uh, and a virtual COP conducted online wouldn't have been just either because of the very real disparities in the level of internet access between uh, the wealthier and the poorer parts of the world. Next slide, please. And unsurprisingly, uh, as this headline says, uh, this year's 
UN climate talks were one of the whitest climate conferences in years. Um, and that's, that's a huge step backwards as uh, the realization that climate change is also a crisis of race, a crisis of inequality and a crisis of white supremacy is increasingly sinking in. And in that context, for the UN climate talks to be whiter than they've been before is a step backwards. Next slide, please. And uh, another thing to point out, another way in which the climate talks were exclusionary is that uh, civil society participants, participants who were not with governmental delegations, you know, people from NGOs, et cetera, uh, were excluded from the negotiating spaces uh, in a way that was an order of magnitude worse than what it was in earlier years. Uh, and, you know, this, this picture shows the lines of police uh, who, kept people out of the spaces where world leaders were meeting to uh, discuss the future of the world. Um, next slide, please. So if delegates from the Global South and uh, delegates from civil society were excluded, who got to attend the COP? This is a really startling number. The delegates who were associated with the fossil fuel industry outnumbered the one largest country delegation, which was Brazil. Uh, and they also outnumbered by a large margin the entire contingent of indigenous peoples from all over the world. So, so really the UN climate talks for all the talk of being a global cooperative space where the climate crisis is addressed turned out to be yet another venue for the powerful to meet behind closed doors to decide the futures of the rest of us. Next slide, please. So what's the way forward for UN climate talks? I am by no means recommending that because the UN climate negotiations process is and has been unjust that we should get rid of it. Obviously, climate change is an international problem that requires global cooperation and international solutions. But some really critical shifts are needed in how the UN conducts the conferences of parties or COPs as they are called. Uh, that would include number one, ban participation by uh, the fossil fuel industry. Uh, just as convicted arsonists shouldn't be at a firefighters conference, similarly, the fossil fuel industry should not be present at the UN climate talks. Uh, similarly, there should be tighter caps on country delegations to prevent wealthy countries from overrunning the talks with a very large presence. And importantly, there should be funding from wealthy countries for participation from the Global South. And that can be thought of as one of the ways in which uh, wealthy countries um, um, uh, fund uh, climate action in the Global South. Uh, and if a critical mass of countries cannot participate for whatever reason, um, pandemics, global pandemics being an important possible reason, uh, then, then the climate talks should be postponed. Uh, and really critically, that's not a prescription for inaction. Just because there are no global climate talks doesn't mean that we're in any way recommending that climate action should talk, uh, should, should stop. Because remember, uh, the climate negotiations are where countries talk about how to address the climate crisis and the actual work of cutting emissions happens at home. And that work should of course continue. 
Um, interesting question in the chat. I'll digress for you know just a few seconds to address that. Um, I don't actually know that off the top of my head. Uh, it wasn't one of the largest country delegations, but it was fairly large. It included uh, many representatives from um, both the administration, the executive branch, and um, several members of Congress. Uh, next slide, please. So yes, a process that is so unjust and exclusionary inevitably leads to outcomes that are unjust as well. And let's dive into that a little bit. Next slide, please. Ah, yes, uh, good point in the chat. Uh, the, the question was, what was the size of the US delegation? And that's what I just addressed. So um, one of the aspects of the um, uh, UN climate negotiations that's particularly concerning is something called Article 6, uh, which is a section of the Paris Agreement uh, that deals with essentially global carbon markets. And this two fundamental problems with Article 6. One is that it reframes the goal of emissions reduction as net zero emissions rather than zero emissions. And the difference is critical. Net zero emissions essentially means that some level of greenhouse gas emissions can continue as long as we are somehow removing those emissions in some way, whether it's by uh, planting a whole lot more trees or um, uh, scaling up some kind of technology to mechanically remove uh, uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, and there's a multitude of problems with reframing the goal as net zero emissions. Number one, uh, those experimental technologies to remove carbon dioxide are exactly that, they're experimental. Uh, so we cannot rely on them to solve an existential crisis. Uh, and planting trees sounds nice, but think about the amount of land that would take and whose land would that be if we know anything uh, from our experience of, of you know, how land is acquired for uh, different kinds of projects all over the world, uh, we know that the worst impacted would be indigenous peoples and uh, impoverished farming communities all over the world. Uh, so, and of course, if you, if you uh, continue emitting some level of uh, greenhouse gases, that would also mean some level of emissions of other kinds of toxic air pollutants continuing to harm uh, the frontline communities who live adjacent to those uh, fossil fuel burning facilities. Uh, so one way or the other, a whole lot more of injustices would continue uh, if the goal is net zero rather than actually zero emissions. And, and um, uh, part of net zero emissions is a global regime of carbon offsets, which is to um, plant trees while allowing fossil fuel extraction and use to continue to some extent. And as I pointed out, that leads to some serious concerns about land grabs from indigenous peoples and you know, in the global south. Next slide, please. And there have been some disastrous developments on Article 6 negotiations in COP26. Uh, one is actual double counting of emissions. To give you an example, suppose um, a company here in the US uh, claims it's reducing emissions by buying carbon offsets in Brazil instead of uh, uh, cutting their own emissions. And so they uh, count the 
carbon sucked up by some trees planted in Brazil as an emissions reduction happening in the US. It turns out the way Article 6 is structured, it will allow Brazil to claim that same reduction in their own domestic emissions. Uh, so the total amount of emissions reductions counted worldwide would be double of the actual emissions reductions. Uh, and that sounds insane, but it's actually something that's being enabled by uh, the Article 6 negotiations. And also, uh, human rights standards of any kind were systematically left out of the Article 6 agreement. Uh, and that's of particular concern because of the prospect of, you know, serious violations of uh, uh, land rights uh, of indigenous peoples and in the global south. Next slide, please. So the transportation conversation at uh, COP26 revolved entirely around electrifying personal vehicles, electrifying cars and trucks. And there was almost no mention of public transportation, bicycling, walking, any of the other more affordable and accessible means of transportation for lower income folks who cannot afford their own vehicles, and that's true of much of the global south, uh, or um, elderly people or people with disabilities who may have trouble driving a vehicle, uh, etc. Uh, and, you know, uh, there was some token language added almost as an afterthought, and that's only because one particular EU official insisted on adding that sentence at the end of their um, declaration on uh, uh, mitigation of transportation emissions. Next slide, please. And it turned out while the climate talks were going on, the Washington Post released a piece of really good investigative journalism, which showed that the climate pledges of many countries are built on flawed data. They undercount emissions. And there's two major ways in which emissions are being undercounted. One is emissions of methane, uh, mainly from oil and gas extraction. It turns out methane is a more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. It's um, about 20 times more powerful over a 100 year window, and as much as 80 times more powerful over a shorter window, over a 20 year window. Um, and the quantity of uh, uh, methane emissions from especially um, unconventional oil and gas extraction, meaning fracking, uh, are seriously undercounted. And the other is the contribution of the land sector, uh, especially forests and agriculture. Um, the degree of uh, carbon sequestration, you know, carbon storage by uh, forests and farmland and grassland, et cetera, is overcounted. And the impact of deforestation and loss of vegetation is undercounted. Uh, so all of these contribute to some seriously flawed data in uh, uh, various countries' climate pledges. Next slide, please. And another thing that emerged from the climate talks is that wealthy Northern countries keep avoiding the degree of responsibility they have for um, addressing climate change globally. And there's, there's three buckets under you know, the ways in which uh, wealthy countries can and should uh, finance um, uh, climate action by poor countries in the global south. One is climate mitigation, which is actually cutting emissions by, for example, um, uh, changing domestic energy systems from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Uh, 
Uh, another is adaptation, which means that even as we are cutting emissions, some level of climate change impacts will continue. So uh, how do we redesign uh, urban centers to be less vulnerable to sea level rise and flooding? Um, how do we have, uh, um, uh, you know, rural communities adapt to wildfires, et cetera? Um, and then a third bucket is what is called loss and damage, uh, which is that, you know, with all of the mitigation and adaptation measures that societies take, there will still be catastrophic um, climate events, you know, hurricanes and wildfires, et cetera. Uh, and how do you pay to recover from that? And loss and damage was a particularly contentious issue at the UN climate talks um, this year. Uh, and essentially, the wealthy countries insisted on just, you know, uh, discussing it to death, uh, you know, postponing setting up any actual funding facility until later climate talks instead of committing to uh, funding loss and damage today. Uh, and it's very important to point out that funding for climate mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage in the Global South from wealthy Northern countries is not charity. It's actually reparations, it's compensation. Because those countries who have built their wealth from uh, fossil fuel industrialization, you know, dating back to the time of the industrial revolution, have a responsibility to pay for the crisis that they created. Uh, but then while we're doing that, let's also acknowledge that even within Northern countries, there are inequalities. Uh, and when we're saying that Northern countries must pay, we really mean that corporations and wealthy people in northern countries must pay, not poor people, not people in environmental justice communities. Um, there's an in interesting question in the chat uh, on the um, US-China agreement and the emphasis on methane. Uh, so two things about that. One is that the emphasis on methane is very welcome because we do need to be um, taking methane more seriously as a greenhouse gas. Uh, but at the same time, uh, talking about uh, taking methane emission seriously on the world stage while refusing to address actual methane emissions happening on the ground at home uh, through increased uh, um, oil and gas drilling and fracking operations is uh, uh, honestly hypocrisy. And I'll you know, get into that more uh, later in my presentation. Uh, the US-China agreement uh, was a very welcome step forward in the sense that uh, here are two of the um, largest and most powerful countries in the world, uh, the two largest aggregate emitters of greenhouse gases, though you know China's per capita emissions are uh, uh, just under half of the US, still on aggregate, they uh, do contribute a massive amount of greenhouse gas emissions. And any serious global action to address the climate crisis has to include cooperation between these two countries. Uh, and also, um, in the context of the kind of uh, US China great power rivalry that we are seeing emerging of late, uh, it is a welcome development that those two countries decided to put that aside and sit down to. Uh, begin a process of uh, uh, talking about cooperation to address the global climate emergency. And that's, uh, we need a lot more of that than just this, you know, one set of talks and uh, um, a declaration. 
we need both the countries, honestly, to be funding, you know, uh, more uh, uh, climate mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage in the global south. Uh, because China is also much wealthier than most of Africa and most of Latin America and most of the Caribbean, etc. Uh, so, uh, so we really need to see a lot more action on um, uh, these counts from both the countries. But uh, regardless, you know, the fact that they met is a huge step forward. Um, uh, Another very interesting question in the chat about uh, uh, should the rich countries prioritize addressing environmental injustice at home? Uh, I would say, number one, absolutely yes. Uh, you know, the wealth of wealthy countries in the global north have been built through a combined process of colonial resource extraction from the global south as well as turning communities right here in you know in wealthy northern countries into sacrifice zones uh, two you know two examples that come to mind are the you know indigenous communities in the fracking fields of North Dakota um, and the predominantly black communities in the petrochemical and refining area in um, Louisiana that is known as uh, uh, Cancer Alley. And um, the industrial wealth of countries like the United States and the wealth of fossil fuel companies have been built uh, on sacrificing the health of communities such as these. Um, um, and I would also point out that addressing environmental injustice at home and addressing global climate injustice by, you know, uh, paying our debts to the global south uh, is not a zero sum game. Uh, it is entirely possible for wealthy countries to do both. I mean, just just look at uh, the amount of money this country squanders on the Pentagon. Just look at the amount of money this country just gives away in um, uh, tax loopholes for uh, you know exploited by wealthy people and corporations. Uh, and you know, just look at the subsidies that this country provides to the fossil fuel industry. We can absolutely. Uh, you know, we absolutely have the resources to do both, to address environmental injustice at home and to um, address what I call global climate apartheid. Uh, and what's more, uh, cutting emissions at home in a targeted way that benefits frontline communities here in the United States first also cuts aggregate US emissions, which also helps uh, people in the global south. You know, one less molecule of CO2 emitted adjacent to a frontline community here in the US means less particulate matter pollution breathed by, you know, uh, the frontline community next to that smokestack here in the US. And it means, um, you know, less dire climate impacts for people in, um, say, a Pacific island that's uh, going under the rising seas. Uh, so there are ways to address this, uh, you know, in a way that's linked instead of trying to treat them as two delinked problems in competition with each other. Uh, next slide, please. So here's one of the most disappointing things that happened uh, at COP26. It's one of those you know, moments where your hopes are lifted up and then they are suddenly rudely dashed to the ground. Uh, so the draft COP26 decision includes this language. 
calls upon parties to accelerate the phasing out of unabated coal power and of inefficient subsidies for fossil fuels. This is literally the first time in the almost 30 year history of UN climate talks that the agreement has even mentioned fossil fuels, which is, you know, uh, uh, startling to begin with. Uh, but note the loopholes in this language. It, it says nothing about phasing out oil and gas. It has this qualifier unabated, which refers to those uh, uh, experimental uh, carbon removal technologies I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, and it talks about inefficient subsidies for fossil fuels. And um, uh, I'd almost make a joke about it, except that this, you know, it isn't funny in terms of the consequences that uh, uh, community space, but what the hell is an efficient fossil fuel subsidy anyway? And uh, interestingly, the push to uh, water down the language even more, initially it talked about phasing out coal and subsidies for fossil fuels uh, and, you know, adding unabated and adding inefficient as qualifiers. Uh, was a push led by the government of India with backing from China and Australia. Uh, and there's some really interesting and nuanced international politics around all of that, which uh, uh, I won't get into now, but I have an article in the works that's uh, uh, going to run sometime in the next few days that uh, uh, walks through some of those nuances. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what's, you know, an overview of what happened inside the official negotiating space. So what happened outside? There was, as you can imagine, massive civil society uh, mobilization worldwide. Uh, there was a global day of action for climate justice on November 6th, uh, which um, uh, entailed actions on every inhabited continent. Uh, and, you know, there were, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people participating in these actions worldwide. Uh, and um, and that, that's just a sampler of the kind of uh, uh, civil society mobilization we saw on the streets of Glasgow, Scotland and worldwide uh, around the global climate talks. Next slide, please. In conjunction with the climate talks, there was a call for real solutions as against net zero. Uh, that was endorsed by about 800 organizations from all over the world, uh, including the um, IPS Climate Policy Program. Um, we were actually involved in uh, the process of drafting the language for the declaration that then got endorsed by uh, uh, 800 organizations from every continent. Uh, next slide, please. And there was a very strong presence of grassroots movements uh, from the United States, uh, including the Climate Justice Alliance and the Indigenous Environmental Network, or IEN, which brings together uh, indigenous communities from across North America, from across Turtle Island, uh, fighting for climate justice for indigenous communities. Um, and, you know, that was a very, uh, you know, noticeable presence on the streets of uh, Glasgow, Scotland, to the extent that um, uh, British media commented that the US pipeline fights were now on the streets of Glasgow, Scotland. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, 
what was the official US role um, in COP26? Uh, so both the rhetoric and the actual action, which I'll get into in a minute, were uh, hypocritical. Uh, so, so here's a small sampler from uh, Biden's address, uh, his uh, official speech at uh, uh, COP26. So he talked about how uh, the Build Back Better framework will make historic investments in uh, clean energy. Uh, two things to point out. And number one, uh, he was making what was potentially an overpromise because remember that the framework hasn't yet been passed by Congress. The Senate is yet to vote on it. Uh, there's no guarantee it will pass, or if it does, uh, that the clean energy components of it, which is what he's talking about, won't be surgically stripped out uh, because that's actually happened to um, many of the climate provisions in the um, uh, different pieces of legislation moving through Congress. It's almost as if, uh, you know, a certain number of uh, members of Congress uh, systematically want to strip climate action from um, from the legislation. Uh, and, you know, of course, the investments are historic because the bar is so low to begin with. Um, also, uh, he said, we are going to cut US greenhouse gas emissions by well over a gigaton by uh, uh, 2030. Uh, and that's, you know, that uh, uh, sounds like an impressive number until you do the math and figure out that that's less than one fifth of US emissions uh, in a scenario where the IPCC, which is the global scientific body, the international, the intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, is calling for worldwide emissions cuts of at least 50% by 2030. And as a wealthy country who can afford to do so, uh, we really should be cutting more than 50% by 2030. Uh, the Biden administration's official pledge in the UN climate talks process, known as the Nationally Determined Contribution, or NDC, uh, is 50% uh, by 2030. But a lot of us in US civil society are calling for uh, actually 70% by 2030 in something we are calling the US fair shares framework. Uh, then he talked about uh, carbon capture systems, which are expensive. They may never work at scale. Uh, they are experimental. Uh, relying on them to mitigate emissions is very risky. And environmental justice communities right here in the US unequivocally oppose uh, carbon capture and storage. And all of that was left out of Biden's speech. Uh, there's an interesting question in the chat. I will get to that. Uh, you know, from now on, I'm going to, uh, just in the interest of time, address questions in the chat afterwards at the end, if you don't mind. Uh, next slide, please. And so that was the rhetoric, this is the substance. So it turns out that the, um, uh, the Article 6 negotiations, which I referred to earlier, uh, which includes this uh, uh, double counting of emissions reductions through carbon offsets, uh, you know, included the US actually playing a role to, uh, finalize this uh, bad rule. And um, here we have uh, a, a climate activist saying that writing bad rules is actually worse than writing no rules uh, because bad rules would lock in the wrong way of doing things, uh, reducing the appetite to actually address the problem the right way next year. Uh, and you know, one little hopeful thing is that a small group of countries uh, led by Costa Rica and Denmark uh, 
formed something called the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, which uh, for the first time committed to actually phasing out um, their domestic um, oil and gas industry. And of course, missing from the list was the world's largest oil and gas producer, the United States. Um, next slide, please. So US claims of climate leadership on the world stage are merely that, they're just rhetoric. Uh, what this chart shows is uh, US oil share of worldwide oil production in 2020. We are, you know, the world's largest oil producer, accounting for one fifth of world oil production, um, almost as much as the next two countries, Saudi Arabia and Russia combined. Um, and what's more, um, if you look at actual expansion plans for the US oil and gas industry, uh, most of global oil and gas uh, output expansion is planned actually in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. And even as we speak, the US is doubling down on this extremely destructive approach where we talk about climate leadership on the world stage, even as we continue with the uh, oil and gas production at home. Uh, and this slide talks about the massive oil and gas lease sale in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which happened literally the week after COP26. Uh, and um, it's the largest US offshore oil and gas lease sale ever. Uh, and the uh, government claims it is to uh, uh, comply with the court order, but there's actually um, uh, substantial legal controversy around that. And there's actually a lawsuit um, uh, challenging the oil and gas sale right now. Uh, and uh, similarly, the day after Thanksgiving, the uh, Department of the Interior uh, release their uh, uh, you know, long awaited report on um, uh, oil and gas leasing on public lands and waters. And whenever the government you know, uh, releases a report the day after Thanksgiving, you know they want less media attention, they want to bury it. Um, and the report talked about the loss of royalties revenue because of uh, you know, the subsidized rate at which we uh, uh, lease our public lands and waters, but it said almost nothing about the um, uh, destructive role of oil and gas leasing on uh, greenhouse gas emissions and on environmental injustice. Um, next slide, please. But US frontline leaders were right there at COP26 confronting US officials. Can, and, you know, before we play this little short video, a bit of background, uh, this is John Beard, a leader of the Port Arthur Community Action Network in Texas. Uh, Port, Port Arthur is a predominantly Black refinery town in Texas, which is, you know, horrifically polluted by uh, several large oil refineries. And here he is speaking with Jennifer Granholm, the US uh, uh, Energy Secretary. Uh, can we have the video, please? Good to see you again. Yes, of course. Yes. 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 Okay. All right. All right. When you say, am I, am I going to stop oil and gas exports? Yes. Uh, 
I am not, that's not my lane, stopping oil and gas exports, that's more the Department of we Interior. We want you started on stage. So I mean, we yeah. permit the, the facility, but the facilities are already, yeah. they're already permitted. We're not, you know, we don't have a human well, there's a few permits that they're trying to do with the uh, Blue Marlin pipeline, so also with suffering LNG in that area. Yeah. You know? But it's a great concern because we're at the nexus of climate change. Yes. The weather, the yes. rainfall, and yes. all of that, and uh, the air quality, plus the quality of life. You know, our people suffer from twice the state national average of cancer, heart, and lung yeah. disease. Yeah. Yeah. And I discovered a friend of mine that I grew up with in the next block is having cancer surgery today while I'm here, so, really? wow. you know, so it's, it's it's a bit of a concern, but I appreciate your time to be able to ask that question. Yeah, I appreciate you being here, too. Thank you. you know, I know we'll be uh, coming back uh, to Houston. I'm guessing Well, definitely take the time to come to Port Arthur. If I have Thank some one of the staff that I can exchange information <laughs> yes. with, yeah, you yeah, can I come by. Okay, so, John Beard, um, I hope you caught the audio, was talking about uh, the environmental justice impacts in Port Arthur, the disproportional rates of cancer, and the climate change impacts, the hurricanes and the flooding. Um, and uh, he was asking Secretary Granholm to address uh, oil and gas exports because the entire Gulf region has been targeted for building um, oil and gas export terminals. Um, and she responded by saying that that's not her lane. Stopping um, oil and gas exports is not her lane. Uh, unfortunately, that's flatly untrue. Um, exports of liquefied natural gas are directly in the domain of the um, US Department of Energy. Uh, next slide, please. I know. So given all of that, what are some ways forward for our climate justice movements? Next slide, please. And I, I'll be talking primarily about domestic movements and how we can um, compel our governments at every level to actually address climate change in a just and equitable way uh, and to make uh, U.S. commitments on the world stage, therefore, you know, uh, more meaningful. Uh, and, you know, I won't be talking very much about pressure to actually ensure that the U.S. deliver on uh, climate pledges, say, on uh, finance for countries in the global south. Uh, not because that's unimportant, but because there's only so much you can cover in, you know, a short webinar. So one thing we definitely must focus on as a movement is uh, to pivot to some real substantive wins in, uh, you know, at the state and local level nationwide. And, you know, one example is that the governor of Oregon uh, signed an ambitious, you know, 100% uh, clean energy bill, uh, which was interestingly in conjunction with another bill that ensured uh, utility bill affordability for lower income communities, uh, just to make sure that the transition to renewable energy didn't happen on the backs of low income rate payers. Um, and it's, you know, really critical that these two things were paired and seen as uh, happening in conjunction rather than in opposition to each other. Uh, next slide, please. And wins at the state level will bring some very tangible benefits. Uh, this is... Um, from a new report that IPS released on a transition to renewable energy uh, in Nebraska, uh, which is a state with the fourth highest wind energy potential in the country, but which still uh, you know, obtains 50% of its energy from coal. Um, and what's more, all utilities in Nebraska are publicly owned. There are no private for-profit investor-owned utilities in the entire state. Uh, so there's really a very 
substantive opportunity for uh, transitioning to uh, renewable energy in Nebraska in a way that's democratically driven. Uh, and uh, just a shout out to one of my colleagues, this beautiful art that you see uh, on the slide are uh, by my colleague, Sarah Gertler. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing we need to focus on is to win real federal climate legislation, which uh, the, you know, the bills moving through Congress right now, they don't even scratch the surface of the kind of uh, transformative climate legislation we need. And I know this is easier said than done, uh, but at the same time, if we don't focus on doing this, uh, we will have missed up, you know, missed out on a huge opportunity um, uh, to address the climate crisis at scale when there's still time to do so. Uh, and um, uh, I actually wrote a recent article um, in, um, in these times that covers exactly this, uh, where, you know, where I talk about the need to uh, pass federal climate legislation that actually uh, both, you know, funds renewable energy on the scale that's needed and funds public transportation on the scale that's needed. Uh, and also it has to undo some of the damage done by the legislation that's now moving through Congress, uh, such as the massive subsidies for uh, carbon capture and storage, which is just another lifeline to the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and some of the highway expansion funding that's now going through uh, in, in the infrastructure bill. Um, next slide, please. And the third and you know, uh, equally important, I would say, uh, uh, prong of, of uh, movement action in the US has to be uh, fighting outside the system, escalating what I term the fight in the street. Uh, and the little example on this slide is the people versus fossil fuels mobilization that uh, happened in Washington DC in October. Uh, it was a, a week of protest uh, led by indigenous and frontline communities uh, with a, a total of 655 people arrested doing civil disobedience, including yours truly. Uh, and um, uh, we have to keep pushing on these kinds of very visible and dramatic direct action. Uh, next slide, please. And this is my last slide, and I'll leave you on a very hopeful note, uh, which is that um, this kind of direct action actually gets results. It generated a massive amount of media coverage, not just during, but even after uh, the mobilizations were over. The little screenshot uh, from um, uh, I forget which outlet that was, uh, but it, it talks about the hearings, the congressional hearings on uh, Big Oil's climate deception uh, that happened a couple of weeks after the People versus Fossil Fuels mobilization. And a lot of the footage that they showed uh, during that, you know, during that coverage was from the mobilization. Uh, and also um, a number of members of Congress um, uh, sent a very strongly worded letter to, uh, to the president, uh, you know, underscoring the demands of the people versus fossil fuels mobilization and calling on him to actually use his executive powers to, uh, um, uh, you know, end oil and gas leasing on public lands and waters um, to um, stop issuing permits for new fossil fuel projects uh, and to revoke the permits for um, uh, 
existing projects you know that were uh, issued using flawed reasoning often during the Trump administration. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. And there's a lot I didn't get to cover, but there's only you know so much you can talk about. And um, I'm very happy to address questions and answers, including one uh, question that I noted in the chat that I'll get back to. Uh, but Tope, um, take it away with uh, with uh, some concluding remarks. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, it's I learned a great deal, um, and I spent a lot of time watching the news and trying to get a deep sense of what was going on, but you've provided a lot of context. We have a number of great questions, but I wanted to start by asking you, um, it sounds to me as if you're saying that the COP framework isn't working. We have this incredibly, um, this, this crisis that is bearing down on us. We need to do something quickly. We need to do something that's grand um, to respond in a really robust way to what's going on. If the COP framework isn't working, and I think we obviously too need a kind of international response to this, is there some other framework you have in mind that might enable us to get together across uh, borders to begin to sort of attack this problem the way we need to? That's an excellent question, Tope. And I would respond by saying that this is one of those um, uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater kind of things where I certainly would not recommend getting rid of the COP framework. But at the same time, the COP framework, as we see, is deeply flawed. Uh, because even though it's on paper, you know, the United Nations, all countries of the world on an equal footing, what we see in practice is that um, uh, wealthy and powerful countries disproportionately the so-called G20 uh, who dominate the proceedings in the COP uh, and also the presence of the private sector uh, including of some of the industries most responsible for the crisis, uh, who actually have more access to the process than global civil society. Uh, so obviously we need to preserve a process of international climate negotiations, while at the same time actually democratizing that process to make sure that every country really does get to participate on an equal footing, uh, that civil society has a robust presence there that's welcomed and not excluded. And conversely, that industry, and especially those industries who are driving the crisis, uh, are banned. Uh, really, there shouldn't be um, fossil fuel delegates at the COP. Excellent. I'm going to move on to some of the questions from folks who've been watching your presentation. Uh, the first question is, could you talk more about what you see as pragmatic avenues for advocating for climate reparations? I see this as really crucial, but I don't know what the strategies are at play at present for working to make this more possible. You know, that really is a difficult question, I will admit. <laughs> uh, because it is hard enough, as we are seeing, to get our government here to focus on emissions reductions at home, to focus on environmental justice impacts in places like Cancer Alley or Port Arthur, Texas, or um, uh, you know North Dakota, or you know any of the places that are or Appalachia, you know any of the places that are really affected by um environmental injustice here at home. So how do we get our government to actually, you know, deliver on the international stage? Uh, my sort of um, uh, thinking aloud response here a little bit is it has to be a two-pronged strategy that's driven both by advocacy at home and advocacy from outside. Uh, let me explain what I mean. So there is a very real palpable sense among affected frontline communities here in the US uh, 
uh, that they see themselves and communities in the global south as a continuum uh, rather than seeing a difference or a divide. Um, and you know, this is very apparent in some of the language from uh, US environmental justice advocates who were at the uh, you know, COP26. And they were talking about how, and they were talking to US officials about how there must be environmental justice both for their communities at home and for um, the global south. Uh, so really some of the same actors who are leading the fight at home can be some of the best advocates for um, global climate justice. Because, and also many of them point out that they are us and we are them in the sense that many of the affected frontline communities here in the US are immigrants from the Caribbean and Latin America and Africa and other, you know, very affected parts of the world. Um, and um, uh, then the second, you know, the second element of this is pressure from the outside, you know, pressure from, uh, you know, starting from civil society in the global south, but ultimately has to be governments in the global south as well. Uh, pre, you know, pressuring the United States and other wealthy countries to actually put their money where their mouth is, you know, to actually start um, living up to some of their lofty rhetoric. Um, and we saw some, you know, tentative steps uh, in that direction. You know, there was some really good speeches from um, the Prime Minister of Barbados uh, and the uh, president of Bolivia uh, at COP26, you know, challenging Northern countries to actually live up to their commitments. But uh, it has to be a lot more than speeches from a few world leaders. There has to be some real diplomatic pressure. Sure, sure. All right, question number two, is there access to any sort of judicial review to establish these issues and the injustices they represent? You know, another excellent question that I should, you know, preface my response by saying that, you know, I, I'm not a lawyer. I don't understand much about uh, the legal basis for any of this. But one thing I will point out is that um, uh, the, you know, the major international uh, youth lawsuits against their governments on climate action. Uh, the example in the US is called Juliana versus United States uh, are actually ongoing. And in some countries like in the Netherlands, uh, the court actually found in favor of the youth plaintiffs and ordered the government to come up with a better climate plan to actually address a livable future for the uh, youth plaintiffs. And, you know, we are far from uh, getting to that point in the U.S., but I also point out that in the U.S., the case is still ongoing. Uh, it hasn't been, you know, ruled on yet. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, do you feel that the current mechanisms for rich countries giving climate finance to poorer countries, like the Green Climate Fund, are equitable? The short answer is no, they are not. Uh, the Green Climate Fund is not perfect. And there was actually an IPS report on the subject a few years ago by my um, uh, colleague, Oscar Reyes, uh, which pointed out how the decision-making within the Green Climate Fund uh, is not democratic and transparent and that you know shows up in the results where there's you know not adequate funding for uh, the poorest and most vulnerable countries uh, there's uh, not enough funding for adaptation etc um, so um, uh, so yes there are problems with the green climate fund but again I would point out that this is another of those uh, 
uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater problems because ultimately uh, the Green Climate Fund is, uh, you know, a UN organization. It is on paper accountable to the entire world, and that's preferable to, uh, uh, you know, bilateral assistance offered by wealthy countries, which, as we know, is. Uh, always politicized in a way that prioritizes the geopolitical interests of the donor country rather than uh, the interests of the recipient country. Could you say just a bit more about what the Green Climate Fund is for those who might not know? The Green Climate Fund is an international fund. It's overseen by an um, uh, international board uh, that disperses funds to countries in the global south for uh, uh, you know climate mitigation and adaptation it doesn't deal with loss and damage uh, and it is funded by contributions from wealthy countries including the united states thank you so much um, why do ej communities oppose carbon capture and storage excellent question and this is something i can you know actually um, address with uh, uh, you know, more than thinking aloud <laughs> and actually know the subject. Uh, so th there's a few different reasons for it. One is, let's suppose we give carbon capture and storage the benefit of the doubt. Let, let's you know, assume hypothetically it actually works. It doesn't, but let's assume it does. Even if it does, we will continue to see some of the other environmental harms of burning fossil fuels. For instance, emissions of nitrogen oxides and particulate matter at the point of combustion. So those communities would continue to get asthma and cancer. And similarly, uh, pollution at the fossil fuel production end, um, you know, water contamination from fracking and oil drilling and you know, things like that. Then there's also uh, greenhouse gas emissions that carbon capture and storage will not mitigate, namely the methane emissions uh, at the point of production, uh, again, from oil and gas drilling. But now let's look at the reality of carbon capture and storage. Uh, number one, it is an inordinately expensive technology. Uh, and suppose we were to apply carbon capture and storage in the um, electric power generation sector. Uh, we already have a utility bill affordability crisis in this country where poor communities, disproportionately black and indigenous communities uh, have a hard time paying their utility bills and they either find themselves disconnected uh, because of failure to pay, or uh, they have to keep their thermostat at an, you know, um, not just uncomfortable, but dangerous level, you know, to uh, uh, air conditioning that's too hot in the summer or heat that's too cold in the winter uh, to be able to afford their utility bills. Uh, and carbon capture and storage in the power sector would just exacerbate that problem. Uh, especially when we don't need to do it because uh, uh, renewable energy technology is already cheaper than fossil fuels and you know already in, um, uh, technically feasible. Uh, yes, sure, we need some more R&D on um, uh, energy storage technologies, for example, to make them even cheaper than they now are and you know, to be able to integrate them at scale. Uh, into our grid. So obviously the transition away from fossil fuels uh, in the power sector is not going to happen overnight, uh, but it can happen really rapidly with the technology that we have today. There's really no excuse uh, for carbon capture and storage in the power sector. Uh, and even in other sectors like uh, steel manufacturing, um, we haven't scratched the surface of the kind of uh, uh, material recycling and reuse that we need to reduce the need for virgin steel, for example, uh, or uh, alternative materials to um, uh, 
steel and you know aluminum and cement etc for construction uh, so so again uh, the fact that industry is willing to consider carbon capture and storage which perpetuates these other environmental justice harms instead of considering these other alternatives when they're all experimental you know uh, these other alternatives are experimental but so is carbon capture and storage you know, what that shows is that the fossil fuel industry is using carbon capture and storage um, as a means of trying to uh, ensure their survival in a time of climate crisis. Uh, and that's a short answer. You know, there's a lot more to say about it, but that's a short answer as to why environmental justice communities oppose uh, carbon capture and storage. If the U.S. is not the leader on climate change, then who is the leader or leading country driving the discussion? So um, I wouldn't necessarily point at one country, but just a few examples. Uh, I pointed out how there's this emerging um, uh, global gas and oil network, uh, which commits to phasing out um, domestic oil and gas production and um, uh, it was started by Costa Rica and Denmark. It includes Ireland, uh, several other countries. Uh, and, you know, that's an example of actual substantive climate leadership. Uh, then some other countries like Morocco has made some really ambitious pledges for greenhouse gas reduction that uh, uh, are, you know, uh, way more than what we would term their fair share of global emissions reduction. Uh, and they're not just, you know, those aren't just empty words. Uh, they are actually looking at major expansion of solar energy in Morocco, which is, you know, they have a geographical advantage there. It's a country with a large, you know, desert area. Uh, then um, uh, there's been, over the years, some uh, really uh, strong language from Bolivia to drive the rest of the world and especially wealthy Northern countries to commit to uh, paying their fair share for climate action all over the world. You know, these are just a few examples of actual leadership, uh, not just in words, but also in substance from, you know, other countries. Mm -hmm. Um, any strategies for dealing with the elephant in the room in the U.S., Joe Manchin? Um, okay, I should preface my answer by saying that, as you well know, you know, Institute for Policy Studies is a 501c3 nonprofit. We do not get into um, uh, electoral issues. Uh, uh, but that said, you know, we have to acknowledge that uh, what we're witnessing here is a massive degree of political corruption. We have a legislator who literally owns a coal company. He personally profits from the continuation of the fossil fuel industry. And I think it is very telling about uh, the pervasiveness of corruption in our political culture and in our media culture uh, that very few people are willing to publicly talk about that and to publicly name that as the reason that, um, that we have uh, you know, the scenario that's playing out right now where one person with an obvious conflict of interest is blocking meaningful climate legislation in Congress. Uh, one reporter from uh, Bloomberg News actually confronted Manchin and questioned him um, very persistently about this issue, about this conflict of interest. Uh, and Manchin's response the best way I can read that is that it was a threat. Uh, he literally said, you better change the subject. 
Mm -hmm. And um, this is yet another example of uh, uh, American exceptionalism and how that comes back to bite us in domestic policy. If this kind of drama were to play out, you know, a legislator with an obvious conflict of interest, uh, threatening reporters, you know, if this were to play out in a country with a majority black and brown population somewhere else in the world, how would the US media treat that versus how are they covering it when it's happening right here in the United States? Uh, and I'd like all of us to think about those, you know, double standards and that kind of hypocrisy and what that means about domestic politics here in the US. Well said, well said. At the height of the Cold War, Hollywood made some very powerful films about nuclear war. The Day After, starring Jason Robards, was one example. Testament was another. I find it surprising that there is no mainstream Hollywood presentation of the impacts of climate change, which could have a powerful impact on public perceptions and options. Any thoughts on getting that message out in film and the arts? You know, as someone who loves the arts and actually, you know, has done street theater in the past, political street theater, I love this question. And yes, there has to be a lot more about climate change in all of our arts, in, you know, certainly in um, uh, Hollywood, but also in uh, theater, in music, in poetry, in, you know, in every kind of art. And I would argue there is, uh, you know, at IPS, you know, when we had a physical office, we were very privileged to share that office with uh, a, a radical poetry organization called Split This Rock. Uh, and they've actually published an anthology of poetry about climate and environmental justice. Um, and also the Climate Justice Alliance, which uh, IPS uh, uh, climate policy program is a member of, uh, has done a recent series of beautiful posters and visual art uh, talking about both the impacts of climate change and the leadership, the visionary leadership of frontline communities in addressing the climate crisis. And we need to see a lot more of that and we need to see it in Hollywood. Uh, I've been hearing uh, on social media about this movie that's either already released or about to be released uh, about a meteor that's about to hit the earth. And many people are talking about that movie as, a meta as intended as a metaphor for climate change. I haven't watched that movie, so I can't you know, really vouch for the accuracy of that. Yeah. I have one final question, Basak. Um, is there anything that you've observed recently, whether from a legislative perspective or anything else that has given you hope that we will do what we need to do to avert the crisis? A lot. So um, even as the uh, federal government is looking honestly increasingly out of touch, uh, and I'll come, come to that out of touch point in a minute, we actually are winning things at the state and local level that we couldn't imagine. Uh, just one more example, in addition to the one I pointed out about Oregon. Um, we have a newly elected mayor in uh, one of our big cities in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, who's hit the ground running uh, in just her first few days in office. She is the first person of color and the first woman to be elected mayor in Boston. Uh, and in you know, just her first few days, uh, she signed a bill divesting the city of Boston from fossil fuels. And she didn't just put her signature on it as a mayor. Uh, she used to be on Boston City Council where she was you know, one of the people who pushed for this uh, bill in the first place. Uh, and she's also, um, made a few bus routes free as a first step towards making the entire public transportation system uh, 
uh, in the city of Boston free. Uh, and the routes she selected to make free are ones that serve predominantly low-income communities of color in neighborhoods such as Roxbury in Boston. Uh, and she worked in very close partnership with an environmental justice organization in Boston, uh, Alternatives for Community and the Environment, ACE. Uh, and and this, is, this is just you know, within her first month in office. And that's the kind of leadership we need to see at the state and local level um, to set an example of what the federal government could do if the federal government had uh, the political will. And you know, when I say the federal government is out of touch, um, here we see a, you know, a, a coal baron who looks like he's you know, parachuted in from a different century who's single-handedly, uh, you know, obstructing climate action in the Senate uh, while being confronted by young people, you know, youth from the Sunrise Movement are confronting him with, you know, uh, uh, singing songs, etc., and chanting every day uh, while, you know, uh, while we have cities and states taking visionary steps to actually address the climate crisis. And that's making the US government looking, you know, increasingly out of touch with the needs of its population and especially with the demands of younger folks. Wonderful. Well, Basab, once again, thank you so much for this incredible presentation, uh, for your perspectives, your analysis, and all the work that you do. And I want to thank all of you for coming. This means so much to us. Uh, please be sure to keep up uh, on the latest analysis from Basab and the rest of our researchers through our email newsletter and our social media, all of which can be found on our website, ips-dc.org. And if you enjoy today's program, please consider donating. Supporters like you make it possible for us to continue this critical work. A gift of any amount can help. You can go to the IPS website to make a donation or mail a check. Thanks again for your support. Stay tuned for more information on the next Lunch Table Talk and have a wonderful day. Thank you. And thank you everyone. It's, it's, it's been a pleasure talking about this. Mm -hmm.